Welcome to the session on Women Driving Sustainable Transformation in ASEAN. This session is co-hosted by the Asian Development Bank and Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia, or ERIA. It's a regional think tank. And my name is Sonomi Tanaka. I will be your moderator. I am a country director of a Lao PDR. Uh, so I'm joining today from uh, the Enchan capital. Before this position, I was uh, leading the uh, gender thematic group of the Asian Development Bank as a chief of uh, gender. So uh, really excited to, to moderate this session uh, this afternoon. So uh, this session critically looks at the, uh, the issues of gender equality and the impact of a COVID uh, had on gender equality, gender inequality that uh, open plenary session talked about. And we were asked this critical question, are women's empowerment, girls' empowerment and gender equality able to play the central role in the recovery in the region um, in a sustainable manner? If so, what are the factors that will accelerate? What are the deterrents? In this session, we have uh, two um, different uh, parts. The first part is uh, uh, to highlight the keynote uh, speech, and uh, it will be uh, started by the opening remarks by uh, our DG Ramesh Subramanian. After that, there will be, um, there will be a, a keynote speech by the Honorable Minister of Women's Affairs of Cambodia, Excellency Dr. Inkanta Pavi. And following that, uh, the second part of this session will be, uh, we'll be speaking with the four innovative, distinguished women speakers who will share with us their experience of, of and insights of the sustainable solutions for COVID recovery and the gender equality, supporting gender equality in their area of work. So uh, we would like to first uh, welcome uh, ADB Southeast Asia uh, Department's Director General, Ramesh Subramaniam. Ramesh has been uh, behind the scene. He's been in ADB for uh, over 24 years. And, and much of the time he shared the, um, the time with this region and Southeast Asia. And uh, he's been the behind the scene of this 60%, uh, over 60% of women speakers in this forum. We are very proud of it. Uh, Ramesh, over to you. Sorry. Thank you so much, uh, Sunami. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. Uh, Excellency uh, Dr. Inkanta, Bobby, very good to see you. Thank you so much for joining us, as well as to the other uh, panelists and speakers. Um, uh, Sunami, you were very unassuming as always about yourself. I wanted to acknowledge the very strong role that you played for promoting gender mainstreaming at uh, ADB for the uh, entire Asia and Pacific region for, for the last 20 years before you moved uh, to this role. Wanted to greatly appreciate and scores of others, our colleagues that have been working with us on this uh, front. Uh, it's my great pleasure to share some opening thoughts for this session. Of course, the keynote speaker, Dr. Favi, will have um, fantastic insights uh, from a country as well as a regional perspective. Uh, I wanted to start this session with a bold statement. Um, a sustainable ASEAN, a, sus a sustainable Southeast Asian region after COVID-19 is one that is led by women. Uh, the pandemic has revealed with, uh, I would say, unfortunately, with a lot of clarity, the gender inequality that has been at the very center of how we have lived and worked. In fact, in some cases, the pandemic has made this gender inequality even worse. Uh, women are often more um, out of, or more often out of work, living in pretty bad, precarious housing conditions, unsafe conditions, unsafe relationships, and with limited access to resources to sustain uh, themselves or their families. Um, you know, those of us working uh, in the field have seen this in many countries uh, around the region. If uh, women are still in uh, work, it's more likely that uh, they will be uh, as informal workers or in lower paid jobs, such as caring roles, healthcare worker, for instance, or domestic or retail uh, workers. Uh, 
uh, you know, be uh, seventy percent of the uh, health sector workforce, particularly nursing workforce, are uh, female. These are our frontline troops in the management of COVID-19. Um, imagine without their tireless work, the pandemic impact would have been far more severe. Uh, they provide the expert care to heal us when sick and deliver vaccinations and healthcare uh, that we all need to prevent the disease, the pandemic from becoming more severe. Uh, and this all happens uh, as they also take on a very heavy domestic care load. Now, this way of living uh, definitely is no longer sustainable and it can no longer be sustainable. Uh, the unpaid and underpaid care economy that has quietly underpinned our society, uh, invisibly supporting the steady economic growth that we've seen in the region and beyond, uh, and silently driving up standards of living across the region uh, should no longer be unseen. In fact, it should be undone uh, and eliminated as much as possible with all the efforts that we are putting in. And we all need to uh, make sure it is understood by one and all. And it must uh, not go on being unrecognized and unvalued if we are to meet the challenges of post-pandemic recovery uh, in an efficient manner, not only now for the pandemic, but also uh, climate change, which will be an even bigger challenge as we uh, move into the next few years. Uh, let me note that the pandemic has made uh, visible a system that uh, obscures and uh, undervalues women's labor, but also poses systemic barriers to women's leadership. Uh, and yet, uh, we know that women bring to leadership different approaches. Uh, the, the, uh, the approach and the value that they bring to leadership, the diversity uh, value of their approach stimulates innovation and improves resilience and risk management. These are all key elements of sustainability, and all of us have seen uh, the diversity value of um, women's participation. Uh, what you are about to hear in this panel are visions for the future from some uh, women leaders who are making a transformational impact now in our society in the midst of all of us, one that in many cases uh, is already reverberating into the future from a social enterprise that preserves heritage craft skills uh, while at the same time protecting the environment uh, to venture capital funds with social impact and an innovative plastic-free retail business that connects local small-scale farmers to urban consumers. Uh, the women on this panel are driving sustainable transformation in ASEAN. Uh, now is the time for governments and businesses to acknowledge and support women's leadership. Uh, not to say that they've not been focusing on, but I think certainly with the post-pandemic imperatives, it becomes even more critical. To remove the barriers to that leadership, uh, we, we, we need to navigate, as we navigate out of the pandemic uh, and face effectively the challenges that uh, are posed by climate change, partnerships are going to be uh, critical, where we not only support women to lead, uh, but we need to act to boost their leadership. This is the transformation that we need for uh, the ASEAN to be more sustainable than what it has been. Um, with these remarks, Sonomi, very eager to uh, hear uh, Excellency Minister of Women's Affairs from Cambodia. Over to you, Sonomi. Thank you, Ramesh, very much. Um, you know, just uh, referring back to what we have heard from the uh, opening plenary this morning, um, you know, the some of the words that you have been um, mentioning has been resonating. So, you know, the first one is a women's leadership. Another thing on the bringing in diversity, which is part of the sustainability. And then, then uh, also uh, focusing on partnerships. And this is uh, also the repeated messages that already have come up uh, earlier this morning, that uh, we are all in this together. So on this note, I have a great uh, privilege and an honor to introduce uh, Our Excellency Dr. Inkanta Pavi, um, Honorable Minister of Women's uh, Affairs of Cambodia. So really, there's no introduction needed uh, for uh, participants in this session, but let me just try out a bit. Um, um, Excellency has been the Minister for uh, Minister for Women's Affairs in Cambodia since 2004. And her, under her leadership, a lot of uh, reforms have been done, which you can see also in her uh, bio. Prior to that, she was also at the Secretary of State uh, of uh, Women's and Veterans Affairs for five years. 
She is a medical doctor by training and she uh, practiced medicine in France uh, before. And in 2014, she was chosen as one of the five women leaders awarded, uh, awarded as most outstanding women in the APEC Women Leadership Forum. And this is my great pleasure to, to have you on board. And then thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pavi. Uh, it's been a while since uh, we also worked together um, uh, for women's uh, empowerment and, and gender equality in Cambodia and also for ASEAN region. It is my great pleasure to introduce you to the panel. The floor is yours. Thank you, Excellency. So, Honorable Mr. Ramesh Subramaniam, Director General, Southeast Asia Department of ADB. Ms. Sonomi Tanaka, Country Director, Lao PDR Resident Mission. But I would like to say, my dear friend, you have been a long, long, strong supporter for gender equality in ADB. Really, uh, and you are a good friend for the Ministry of Women's Affairs in the Kingdom of Cambodia. Distinguished panelists and participants of Southeast Asia Development Symposium 2022, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. So greeting from the Kingdom of Cambodia. It is my pleasure to join you today to set the scene for the following panel discussion on the important topic of women driving sustainable transformation in ASEAN. As was emphasized again and around the world, during last week's commemoration of International Women's Day 2022, under the theme of gender equality today for a sustainable tomorrow. So advancing gender equality, women's rights, and women empowerment in the context of climate crisis is one of the greatest global challenge in the 21st century. However, we are still dealing with the negative impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, and we are fighting for moving away from business as usual so that we can turn the crisis and the recovery into decisive act and real opportunities. ASEAN joint goal is to build a sustainable, inclusive and prosperous future that truly leaves no one behind. And to do that, nothing less than a transformative approach is necessary. In ASEAN, we have come a long way in laying the groundwork and building a strong foundation for opening the doors to such a transformative approach. Two recent ASEAN milestone even have strongly contributed to this. The 2020 ASEAN Leaders Special Session at the 36th ASEAN Summit on Women Empowerment in Digital Age and the first ASEAN Women Leaders Summit 2020 Team Women Role in Building a Cohesive, Dynamic, Sustainable and Inclusive ASEAN Community in a post-COVID-19 world. Why? Because firstly, the year highest ASEAN level leadership acknowledgement that never preparing the region readiness for a turning point in history, namely the fourth industrial revolution, nor realizing a sustainable, inclusive, peaceful, secure, and prosperous post-COVID future for ASEAN is thinkable or doable without women and girls and without putting the empowerment, participation, rights, and leadership point and center. Secondly, they generated highest ASEAN lead level leadership commitment, which complement ASEAN comprehensive set of strategic framework and arguably outline an umbrella framework of commitment for many years to come. These include, for example, I just give you four exa few examples. The first one is ensuring that women are the architect and beneficiaries of effort to build back stronger and better by designing gender responsive policy and by placing women leadership and contribution at the heart of the recovery effort, particularly in the implementation of the ASEAN Comprehensive Recovery Framework. Second, ensuring that women and girls are equally able to reach their fullest potential and to access quality education, healthcare, economic resources, political participation, leadership and decision-making at all levels. Third, improving women access to opportunities and responding to emerging challenges in the context of rapid development in science, technology, and the digital transformation. And fourth, building the resilience, for example, by strengthening women economic empowerment through digital and financial inclusion, recognizing, redistributing, unpaid care and domestic work. I heard from uh, Honorable Director General of talking about the unpaid 
unpaid care and domestic work, developing inclusive and accessible social protection programs, investing in gender responsive public and social infrastructure. Now, building open this was instrumental for the royal government of Cambodia as Cambodia is chair of ASEAN in 2022, when it conceptualized the team for the second ASEAN Women Leaders Summit planned for October 2022. The team was to contribute to boosting gender equality and women empowerment within the context of building sustainable, inclusive and resilient ASEAN that secures social economic development and maintain peace and security throughout the region. And of course, investing in women entrepreneurship and economic empowerment is one important part to do this because it is an effective means to generate progress on gender equality and poverty eradication. It is also an increasingly important key driver, key driver for stability, inclusive growth and sustainable development, which can yield enormous dividend for peace and prosperity. Why micro, small, medium enterprise are the backbone of ASEAN economy, women entrepreneurs still face many challenges. That's the second ASEAN Women Leaders Summit seeks to contribute to accelerating progress in women entrepreneurship development and economic empowerment through the team, building a more sustainable, inclusive and resilient future, unlocking women entrepreneurship in ASEAN. To drive this process would have to include, for example, if I may say just six examples, is the first one is promoting transformation to our entrepreneurial ecosystem that foster women entrepreneurialism, innovation and creativity, create a level playing field for women to compete, thrive and lead and strengthen opportunities for women in frontier technology and innovation. Second, addressing challenges amid the COVID-19 pandemic, climate change, and ASEAN path to digital and green economy by identifying innovative ideas and best practice for boosting women businesses recovery and building their long-term resilience, prosperity, and competitiveness. Third, enhancing women participation and leadership in innovative and emerging sector and trends. For example, in social enterprise, impact investment, and mission-driven businesses, or in the care economy, who has incredible size and increasing potential, hold many opportunities for women businesses. Fourth, promoting the mainstreaming of gender equality, economic opportunity and women empowerment as core component in policy framework and agenda, responding to COVID-19 recovery and climate change, and also promoting digital economy and green growth with greatest attention both to resilience and sustainability consideration. Fifth, Furthering respond to existing challenges, such as women financial and digital inclusion, access to education, careers and businesses in ICT and STEM field, access to productive resources, assets, services and infrastructure, as well as addressing women on paid care and domestic work. Ways to address the latter would have to include both investing in care economies and strengthening social protection mechanism in coordination with the different social policy sector to drive improvement, including in access to affordable and quality child care and health care. Six, mobilizing all relevant stakeholders and advocate for more leadership and commitment, as well as accountability and action by all stakeholders, especially the private sector. Of course, the seven point is more for a conclusion is at least at last but not least, while we must continue setting the path toward more and faster turning of commitment into action and result, we also have to give more visibility and attention to the insight, expertise and knowledge of our ASEAN women leaders in public and private sectors. In and through their daily work, they are among the drivers and agents of change for promoting and contributing to sustainable agenda, respond and impact for the wing led lead and responding to the advice and insight is indispensable for driving a sustainable transformation in ASEAN. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Excellency. Uh, very inspiring uh, speech, but also it has all the elements, your seven points of all the elements that uh, this session wanted to touch upon. And again, uh, thank you also for expanding the notion of a sustainable solution and that the sustainability, it not only means bringing and then climate change responses, but also inclusive and resilient in terms of economic and in social. And this is why gender equality and women's empowerment, particularly women's leadership, is has to be at the very center. Another thing that you have raised that also this came out of a Ramesh's speech as well is the, the care economy, the need to look at the care economy for uh, women to be economically and, and, and socially uh, participating actively into the uh, sustainable solution for uh, COVID recovery. So uh, on this note, thank you very much. Um, Excellency, uh, if you can stay on with us, uh, it will be really great because uh, there'll be also uh, uh, the question from the audience and uh, uh, we'd appreciate if you could stay on uh, with us until the end. So we will now move on to the, the, the second part of the session, which will be um, having the four speakers. But before introducing the four distinguished speakers, I wanted to go back to the very issue, uh, once again, of what this session is all about. So this morning, we have heard from the plenary and, and some of the speakers, uh, particularly uh, Sophia Sinero from uh, uh, Care International, as well as uh, Shamina, Shamina Singh, MasterCard, they were pointing out the uh, importance of the gender equality and narrowing gender gaps in the uh, COVID recovery phase will be very crucial for sustainable solutions. And uh, uh, Sophia, I think, was uh, using and uh, quoting this uh, figure from the World Economic Forum, looking at uh, how many years for gender inequality uh, globally to be narrowed to, to the equal basis. Even before the crisis, it was 95 years old. It was going to take 95 years old, uh, 95 years to, to narrow the gender gaps in the, globally. And after one year of a COVID experience, it has expanded to 145 years. And that's a huge, huge uh, realities that uh, we all need to look at. Women and gender equality should be the solution. There's no, uh, uh, there's no other option, but uh, we have a lot of stakes and then uh, there has to be a lot of uh, uh, efforts from uh, all parts of society, whether it's the public sector, private sector, um, uh, those who are in businesses, those who are in the political arena, we all have to work together on this. So uh, on this note, I would like to introduce now the, the four speakers who are, are very active in their areas and the diverse sectors in the ASEAN member states. And um, they will be speaking about their own experience and they will give us a hope and an idea about how gender equality or women's empowerment can be um, a solution, sustainable solution in the COVID recovery phase. Uh, let me introduce, uh, first of all, uh, Danica Ridani, Ridini uh, Flesh, sorry. Uh, the founder and CEO of uh, Sukachita in Indonesia. And Sukachita is a social enterprise that uh, focuses on the rural women's lives um, in Indonesia. And uh, the second speaker is uh, Von Lia. She is a CEO, uh, sorry, co-founder and, and, and the general partner, sorry, of the Purpose Venture Capital in Singapore. She's an investor investing in early stage tech ventures. And uh, the third speaker is Priyanka Chetri. Priyanka Chetri is the CEO of Grossudel in Cambodia. And a Grossudel is an online grocery store that provides plastic free delivery of the, the fresh local food and Cambodian made vans. And uh, finally, Dr. Bani Narita, she's a senior officer, science technology division of ASEAN Secretariat in Indonesia. And, and Bani was awarded the World Economic Forum Young Scientist uh, uh, New Champion. She holds two patents on hepatitis B and dengue recombinant uh, proteins. 
within a national consortium of the vaccines and the medicine led by PT Biopharma. So welcome all four of you to this session. Thank you very much. So I'm going to start asking questions one by one uh, on your experience of how you're doing um, your business in a sustainable manner or uh, in your area of work and how you are supporting uh, gender equality or women's empowerment uh, throughout. So maybe I will ask uh, uh, Danica first. So uh, Danica, thank you very much for joining us. You are the founder of the social enterprise Sukachika, and you said that it means happiness and, and it is a very, very nice naming. It's a small company working with women and uh, rural women in Indonesia. Could you uh, tell us what your uh, business model has been and in what way uh, you have been supporting uh, uh, gender equality, women's empowerment, and also the sustainable solution uh, in the COVID recovery phase? Thank Danica. you for me for that question. Hi everyone, my name is Danica and I'm the founder of Sukachita. We're a social enterprise in Indonesia that works to end the exploitation of women who make your clothes. I myself am actually a development economist. I have no background whatsoever in fashion, but my work took me through rural Indonesia. And there for the first time, I actually saw how our clothes are being made by women in their homes. It was actually really beautiful, but at the same time, I couldn't help to notice their struggle. They're invisible to the market and most of these women are trapped in poverty. It was also very shocking for me to learn that 98% of women who make our clothes don't even earn a livable wage. What makes things worse, the way our clothes are currently dyed, the chemicals that are being used, is the second largest polluter of fresh water globally. That was the moment when I realized that I wanted to build a bridge between you and these remarkable women, connecting them with access to education and living wages so they can lift themselves out of the poverty, not through aid, but through fair work. And the, uh, I started Sukachita in 2016 with only three women. And today we provide access to 1,500 women across villages in Indonesia. Thank you, Danica. Uh, Danica, you have a, your business has been quite uh, successful uh, so far in, in uh, pulling together and supporting 1,500 women. Um, has there been any impact, negative impact of COVID so far? Yes, like any businesses, we were hit hard in the beginning of the pandemic. But then I started realizing that I believe that purpose should never be a crutch, but it should be an anchor. So we switch everything up. We started really being, start focusing on the enterprise part of the social enterprise, really understanding what our customers want and how their lives have changed because of the pandemic and innovating to create products that actually are solving problems in their lives. So these two years, instead of growing smaller, we actually managed to grow. We added 500 additional women actually and built another uh, craft school. And that's why I firmly believe in the power of the social business model to be the solution if we are talking about inclusive growth in ASEAN. Thank you. That's a very inspiring. Thank you so much. I'll uh, move on then to uh, another entrepreneur, uh, Ms. Priyanka Chetri from Cambodia, who is uh, the CEO of Girls Hotel. And your company, mission is to deliver a fresh uh, local product to, uh, from small scale farmers to the uh, consumers across Cambodia. So um, could you tell us also like uh, uh, Danica's case, what has been the elements for your success? Has, uh, have you not been affected by COVID? And uh, what are the factors that have led you to your um, success? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the question, Sonomi. And thank you, everybody, for having me here. I think uh, you asked me, like, what has COVID done for us? I 
can say that for e-commerce business where we are from grocery business, it was a blessing in disguise. I can say that because that was the business which was booming during the COVID time and I will not deny the fact. So I can say the Grossadel journey is filled with load of experimenting strategies. On when COVID hit us hard, the only thing which we understand was that we need to be ready for all kinds of changes and change was only constant thing which we can rely on. We focus on being sustainable, being trusted and working on the supply chain, which helped us during the COVID time. And I can say for two years of time until today's day. The sustainable approach which we had in our business by doing cross training to our staff, it helped us to do the groundwork during the difficult time. So to meet the demand when there was an overnight hype of the demand, rather than recruiting the new staff, we were able to meet the demand with our existing staff. Sustainable towards environment, when we say that, we do plastic-free deliveries when we do our delivery of groceries. So this is our contribution which we are doing towards the environment. That made us happy and in turn, when the customer were receiving the orders, they were also happy receiving plastic-free delivery because they felt that they were also doing their bits towards the environment and which helped us a lot to retain the customer on a longer run. With COVID, uh, I think I would also say that with COVID, we saw a shift in the buying behavior of the consumer. Before, when COVID started, they panicked. They used to buy packaged and processed products and storage store it for a longer time. But slowly, the behavior changed. Customers were looking for more sustainable and environment-friendly products, organic, healthy alternative to the normal product, and also wanted to support the no normal local farm farmers to reduce the carbon footprints. If I have to give an example, I remember the customer were buying eggs which were produced locally rather than the commercially produced eggs. It in turn helped the local vendor to see a steep growth in their sale of the product and build a relation of trust with Grosser and after that, there was no looking back. And currently, I can proudly say that we have more than 250 producers and 3,000 farmers with whom we are directly or indirectly working. And just to add on to that is that out of those, 70% of the producers are women who are working with us. And I would also like to say, uh, add on that during the initial time, it was not so easy to convince the vendors to sell their products online because initially when COVID was not there, they did not believe, they did not trust, they thought that online shop will eventually die as few people were doing grocery shopping online and it was no much of difference from a consumer's point of view also. There is no denial of the fact that COVID-19 has speed up the adaptation of online sell and also for the offline retailer were forced to adapt to sell their products from offline to online. For the consumer now, shopping has uh, become safe, convenient, and more or less, I say it's a lifestyle change from a consumer point of view also. And this two years, COVID have taught us that we need to be together to support each other. For us, it revolved around supporting the sale of our farmers and producers, building the trust and being the go-to place for the consumer and having a sustainable team. Thank you. Thank you, Priyanka. This has been extremely impressive. Um, and, you know, you continue to mention trust. This is also, uh, you know, it's a very important uh, element of uh, um, and building a business relationship. And also the behavior changes of the customers that are into uh, more uh, sustainable supply chain, sustainable uh, products. Um, that's a very important. And, and this is also kind of linked to uh, women's empowerment and, you know, women tend to be in this type of a businesses. And, and this is one of the areas that uh, Danica also talked about in terms of a change in behavior of the consumers that are into more uh, the, the products and the supply chains that are into, uh, in support of uh, sustainable development goals. So um, thank you, both of you. Uh, moving on to uh, Ms. Wong Liam.
So Ron, um, now we've been talking about the entrepreneurships and, and women in business and, and, and the value chain. You are an in, impact investor um, working on, in Singapore and, and for the region. And uh, as an impact investor, uh, you are supporting the uh, companies, uh, enterprises that are um, looking at the, the SDGs areas. So um, would you be able to talk a little bit about what you're doing? And have you also seen, I've been asking everyone if there has been any changes in the, uh, among the investors' uh, behavior changes during the uh, COVID period. For example, I've seen um, more of a, say, gender bond. There are investors that are in interested in gender bond, um, uh, environment bond, green bond. So you must have also seen the behavior change. So uh, over to you, Vaughn, in terms of uh, what you're doing and how you see the, the changes in the behavior among the investors. Thank you. Hi. Thank you, Tsunami. Um, Hello, everybody. Um, thank you to the invitation to join all of you. And I'm very happy to join uh, your excellency as well as the honorable director general and, and entrepreneurs and technologies in this panel. Um, for me, as an impact investor, uh, first thing you need to know is that uh, impact investment, uh, regardless of the context that we are operating right now, is actually a very nascent uh, industry in ASEAN. And this is for all types of investments across many asset classes, sectors, or the regions. Um, these are investments that has the intention to generate positive, measurable social environmental impact a lot, alongside a financial return. Okay, so what that means is that uh, most of the investments that you probably hearing are more skewed to above market rate type of financial returns. So we're still um, the minority in the whole finance sector. Uh, although I must say that the growth of the impact investment has been growing. In uh, back in 2019, there was a study that the current market size. Uh, which must have grown, uh, is at USD 715 billion with over 2,000 organizations that's allocating or managing this impact investments. Now, even though it's relatively new, as you point out, Tsunami, that investors are getting interested because of COP26, because of the ASEAN leaders, because of G7, G20 agendas. Um, so generally, we're optimistic about this overall development and we expect there will be increasing scale and efficiency in, in the future. Um, so it's a significant achievement, uh, but we need to maintain this growing momentum because as I said, it's still nascent. Um, there are some significant challenges that needs to be addressed. Uh, for example, uh, seeking appropriate capital across the risk return spectrum, uh, sourcing for quality investment opportunities, having suitable uh, exit, uh, suitable and uh, healthy exit options becomes even more challenging now, considering the pandemic, we're still in the pandemic, as your excellency has pointed out. And also now with the inflation environment that we are operating in, and of course with the Russian uh, European war. So one way to de-risk this is, uh, is to partner with long-term committed investors, such as family offices, uh, philanthropy foundations, and governments. So uh, in our case, our co-investors uh, include single family offices uh, from Singapore, Hong Kong, and Indonesia. Uh, and we, and as you pointed out in the opening remarks, uh, we partnerships are very important. So we are now recently partnering with the Masik Foundation and Ego Business for their global competition called the Livability Challenge, where we seek uh, quality global solutions to solve biodiversity, food security, climate adaptation and mitigation solutions. So um, 
Interestingly, like Danica, uh, her background is not in fashion. Uh, my background is actually not in finance. My background is in organizational psychology, HR, and digital transformation. My last two roles were working for Singapore government as the chief digital health marketplace, as well as the uh, person in charge of this multi-million dollar uh, digital transformation project for IBM. In fact, it was the largest AI project then back in 2019. Uh, I was born in a working class family. So I was a beneficiary, if you like, of social welfare programs. So this is my personal belief that, you know, there is power uh, uh, to lift people up through purpose, through uh, using resources like people and technology to change the world. Um, so my mission now is really how could we advise and, 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 and also build inclusive, sustainable tech companies with my co-investors and partners, especially to inspire and invest in women to become tech entrepreneurs. Um, so instance, right now, my portfolio is about 45% in women-led businesses, uh, but I'm also interested in how do we build more blended finance partnerships with governments, with AFI such as ADB, philanthropists, to support recovery and build sustainable transformation. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. You know, I've been also uh, part of my past uh, um, um, as a gender chief, I also work with uh, some of the NGO investors in the, within the region, but really to, who are supporting uh, women-led enterprises. But you really find a, a female around. And, and I wanted to ask Vaughn, uh, what is the situation? Do you also encounter, you see more uh, women investors uh, and venture capital leaders coming up? Uh, no. There are not many of us. <laughs> okay. um, so upscaling is very important, I think. Uh, but the other thing is that it remains an old boys network. Uh, having said that, uh, some of my personal mentors are both female and male. Uh, it tells me a lot. Uh, firstly, within the industry, I told this to our Singapore minister before as well, uh, depending on which studies that come up, 2 to 4% of VC funding goes to women-led businesses. Uh, and I think that's primarily because a lot of the investors themselves are not women. Okay. Um, and, and, and that's not because they are not trying to get more women. But I think it's also because there is lack of platforms and support to help women to become investors. So as I mentioned, I am not from a finance background. Um, so it's by virtue of if you like motivation, as well as having suitable co-founders, uh, one male impact investor and one female single family office uh, uh, partner. Uh, and uh, we came together to form Purpose Venture Capital with the intention to invest in uh, tech companies. The other thing we need to take note, a lot of women like to start businesses in the care economy in the uh, economies, that, uh, in, in, in trades and industries that are familiar to them. What they see every day in their communities, uh, what they need is to open their eyes to the emerging technologies, to the emerging sectors, uh, go beyond social entrepreneurship, go into the future. Where are the investors investing in? We are looking at blockchain, we're looking at AI, we're looking at IoT, we're, but uh, there's not enough conversations and not enough uh, innovations that came forward by female entrepreneurs themselves. So we need to help women to also pursue their ambitions by looking beyond to the future with these emerging technologies. So uh, this is also the reason why we find it very hard, even we have the intention to invest in more women, that we find it they are not investable in many ways because uh, a lot of their products and services is not for the future, but is for now. So, so for us in the venture capital game, what we're looking is for, uh, as impact investors, we try to have 4X, but for most of the venture capital um, uh, capitalists, we're looking for 10X, 28. <laughs> You know, so 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 we need to be very mindful that this is one good reason why female entrepreneurs are not receiving the funding. 
this is very, very uh, crucial point that you're raising. And also, you know, the fact, I mean, that you're in the, uh, the technology sector and that's a particular issue, but also the lack of support to women as investors is something that uh, uh, many of us actually tend to forget about that because, you know, it is all, it's pretty much about supporting women as uh, entrepreneurs and, and uh, train them in the financial literacy and support them with the, the right infrastructure and so on. But the women as investors is something that is uh, not there yet. And, and thank you very much for, for raising that uh, the point. So I'd like to move on to uh, the fourth speaker now to uh, Vani Narita. So uh, Vani, you are a scientist and, um, and a young scientist at the ASEAN Secretariat working with other scientists to advance the science and technology area. And you, know, you are what we call as a STEM woman, a science, technology, engineering, and math, where um, you know, it's one of the areas of, sort of something we call the non-traditional female areas in terms of education and also our career path. Um, do you see the opportunities increasing or decreasing for women as scientists uh, and related to COVID? Um, and how do you see the potential for more women coming in in the science technology area? And then what can we do about that? Over to you. Thank you, Sonomi. And uh, it's really an honor uh, for me to speak in this forum, excellencies and also colleagues. Um, yes, my, ba my background is uh, science and technology, but I think I'm moving uh, forward a little bit into diplomacy and trying to bridge uh, cooperations in Southeast Asia. Uh, so I think uh, in terms of the pandemics, we can see uh, that there are some opportunities arise, but also uh, create some uh, divide or gaps in our regions. So for women, I think there are still a lot of rooms to improve in, uh, in Asia, especially in Southeast Asia. So for example, um, in Southeast Asia, the, our population consists of 50%, actually 50.1% of a woman, and only 30% of it um, doing research. And most of them are not uh, holding the uh, decision makers or like um, senior positions. So I think there are still a lot of to achieve. And uh, in our uh, division, science, technology, and innovation is an integral component of all economies in ASEAN, uh, as uh, we mentioned. And we have uh, ASEAN uh, plans of actions in science, technology, and innovations consists of four trusts. One of them is also women uh, involvement, inclusivity, and also women empowerment. And uh, in regards to this, uh, we've been trying to also to do a gender mainstreaming with the uh, ASEAN uh, Committee on Women together with ASEAN Economic Community. So I'm pretty sure we have a lot of uh, opportunities, but we also need some supports. For example, as uh, Von Leung mentioned that, um, for example, not so many women are involved or pursue career in AI applications. So for example, we have an, uh, an event, actually uh, ASEAN Underwriters Laboratories, uh, US Women uh, pro uh, Science Prize uh, for Women. And this, uh, the theme for this year is AI applications in health and uh, safety. Not so many applicants actually <laughs> submitted their applications. So, uh, but on the other hand, I think uh, more and more women are interested. I know some uh, women actually did uh, their PhD in AI and data science, even from CMLB countries. And I know them uh, personally uh, because we, we are in the same fellowships for uh, ASEAN uh, Science and Technology Fellowships. And uh, the other opportunities that I, I want to raise a little bit is also the involvement or partnerships between scientists, technologists, engineers, and also 
entrepreneurs, especially women entrepreneurs like uh, Jenica, Priyanka, and also, of course, uh, somebody that knows and familiar with uh, investment. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, and, and it's a, it's a interesting and uh, not surprising though that, that there are echoing um, messages about the importance of uh, women supporting other women uh, and uh, supporting the women leadership network and in particular science and technology uh, um, and STEM areas. And uh, it's really, um, inspiring and encouraging to hear Bani talking about uh, this network. Um, okay, so um, we have, a, a, I'd like to also encourage the uh, participants to put in uh, questions and, 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 and comments. So I can uh, pick up, but we can pick up and then get back to you. Uh, to these uh, uh, four speakers, I'd like to uh, go around for the second round of questions and uh, ask this uh, big question about moving forward on uh, women's roles or gender equality in the sustainable solutions. So you are already in there and in supporting that, but uh, when we are in front of these uh, uh, figures about the reversal trend during the um, COVID period and, and which still continues by the way, in the past two years, uh, a lot of gender-related uh, indicators have worsened. And uh, we all see that the reverse trend of uh, hard-won gains uh, on gender equality in the past is, uh, is, uh, is having a, a problem. And so um, in your area of work, what would you think is the best strategy forward for supporting gender equality uh, or women's or girls' empowerment uh, uh, in providing that sustainable solution um, in your area of work. So maybe I'm going to uh, ask uh, um, Danica first again. Big question. <laughs> What we definitely are seeing is that women in rural areas are already experiencing the negative impacts of climate change. That's for sure. Most of them live on subsistence farming and then the climate impact is really already felt by them. Flooding, drought and <clears throat> heat waves are really killing their crops. So when you ask about what we can do to support them, I believe it's all um, a question of access. Right now, there is a big gap between the policy sector when it comes to education and skill-based education that provides women with the skills they need to navigate through climate change with the actual reality that are being faced by these women in the villages. For instance, women in the villages tend to get married young and after they're married, they're, it's very difficult for them to actually leave the village to go out and seek employment. But the thing is, there are no jobs in the villages and there are no higher schools beyond primary school in villages. So I feel like this, this huge gap are in particular making women a lot more vulnerable towards the impact of climate change. And then only by addressing this gap can we actually change it. Like to give you an illustration, uh, what we do as a social enterprise we use our profits to build craft schools in our villages. We have four so far. And then we calculated that with every dollar we invest in these schools, these women are creating $32 of inclusive work for their communities. So you can see there that by investing in them, investing in the invisible, you're actually providing a solution for growth that, that is both inclusive and sustainable because women, what we have found, are more suited to be caretakers of the planet as well when it comes to the production impact. Thank you, good point. Uh, very good point also looking at the uh, climate change and actually women are already playing an important role within the communities of managing the environment and then, then investing in women will actually really have a much uh, um, um, diverse benefit out of that. And thank you very much for that. Um, Vani, 
I will just uh, change the order. So I'm going to ask Vani. So a uh, similar question, uh, what can, so we see you as a representative of a women in this uh, STEM area. Um, what, how can we support, how do you see that the things will become easier for women in STEM area? What are the type of support do you think are necessary um, is this the role model? Is this the, the education? Is this something else, a business opportunity? Um, anything you might think about as, um, well, and particularly we have a, a excellency on board with us. If you have any suggestion also for ASEAN to consider, since also you all work in the ASEAN Secretariat. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think uh, one of um, the need that we, we have in order to um, reduce the gender gap, one of them is to be um, involved in the decision making. I know we are scientists, we're not used to uh, sit in front of the like big uh, meetings, but uh, in my experience, especially since I'm involved in the ASEAN Secretariat, it's really important for uh, scientists and technologists, um, especially those uh, women uh, scientists to get involved in the decision making. So uh, therefore we will be involved in the decision making with a greater flex flexibility to address the challenges that a, a woman face, not only scientists and engineers, but also the uh, entrepreneurs. And by having uh, policies and regulations and improvements in public operations, we can mitigate the uh, broader impact of the crisis and therefore improving the gender gap. And um, three uh, needs uh, that we, we want to improve is that, of course, the access. We have a huge digital uh, uh, divide now and we need a networking. Uh, we need what some kind of a platform that connect all of us. Uh, sometimes we, will, we work in silo, especially in scientists is in our convenient lab <laughs> space. And we also need uh, someone actually to upgrade uh, our skills, especially those that are less unfortunate in less developed countries. And of course the role models are always great. Uh, mentoring system is always, uh, appreciated in our uh, ecosystem as a scientist. Thank you so much. Good point, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, again, I think that the networking and then platform for networking, which came out of the uh, other speakers as well, uh, uh, you resonated on that and thank you so much. Um, Priyanka, from your perspective, uh, so you said earlier that the, yes, e-commerce the, you know, was uh, well, COVID created a more uh, enabling environment for, for e-commerce as a whole. Um, but how do you see it moving forward uh, in the women in e-commerce in terms of the challenges and opportunities, and how uh, sustainable can we make it? Uh, um, what are the things that need to be done to make it more sustainable and a sustainable solution for the for the community? I, I was hearing all of us speaking about different topics, but everybody were boiling down to one thing that is the networking sessions and then access to institutions and stuff like that. I think that is the core most important thing that we need to focus mostly on. So if I have to give you a broader examples of how we have changed in the past two years, when I say that we have so many producers who are producing uh, stuff back at their home, those are women producers who are producing things back at their home and they are trying to change because before they were uh, before they were selling offline, now they are trying to sell online. They are trying to change. For example, they need pictures. They need labeling of the products. Now nobody's going and touching their product. Nobody's going and feeling their product. The only thing is somebody is buying their products is by the visuals, how they are going to present it, what is written on that. 
I think that is the most important thing, which from our e-commerce point of view, we need to focus on. In Cambodia, I would like to say there are many projects which are running in. The most important one which happened is the good practice guidelines, which we have it in Cambodia. After COVID hit, we have the good practice guidelines where MSMEs can go inside and have a look on that. What are the necessary points for them and how they can do it, how they can sell it from offline to online. That is one of the most important thing which was there for us being the business owner and for uh, from a vendor's point of view when they have so many doubts so many questions at that point of time when we were not able to address yes the good practice guideline which was which is here in Cambodia helped us a lot I think that is one of the most important aspects I would like to highlight the other thing which is uh, uh, happening here to develop the e-commerce economy ecosystem is the go for camp project where MOC is promising to enhance the uh, e-commerce environment with, uh, with setting up the e-commerce association and also with a small grant for the MSMEs to be onboarded on the marketplace. I think these are the small initiatives which helped and which will be helping us in future. And if I have to speak about the networking on a broader point of view, uh, I was lucky enough to be a part of E-Trade for Women, which was initiated by Antap, where there are women entrepreneurs, women digital entrepreneurs, I would say that from different regions, where we come together and trying to form uh, a group of uh, women entrepreneurs, where we sit down, discuss how things happening, what is the good thing which you did, what is the bad thing which I did, and we are trying to learn from each other. I think that is also a good point I would like to highlight. And I feel these initiative and awareness will help us to enhance the business environment and also a build an atmosphere of mutual trust and understanding, be it the private sector or the public sector. And as I said earlier, 70% of our uh, small scale or uh, the medium producer at Grosadel are female and to ensure their sustainability via access to technology, training, access to the market and innovation centers will be a stepping stone for them. Uh, but I would like to say that fundamental to this success would be women having uh, access to equal opportunities. I feel being in this position and have led this Grossadel for so long, I think the access to equal opportunity is the key thing which we are lacking behind till today. Thank you. Priyanka, that was a very uh, comprehensive uh, uh, point that you're making. Um, I'm going to ask Vaughn uh, in a different way because you already kind of gave us uh, some suggestion earlier, but um, in, um, in moving forward uh, with uh, gender equality in, the, in this nascent uh, impact investors, investors world, is there any role that the government can play or the, the policy enabling environment that the uh, government can create so that uh, more women investors uh, can be uh, on board. If you have any suggestions, that will be good. Okay, so I'm not interested, it's not that I'm not interested in networking. <laughs> I'm more interested in what moves the needle. Okay, what will really create a sustainable transformation. So we need to stop talking about gender equality. We need to make this economic agenda. Um, so I'm talking, so I have three responses um, and I wrote them down because this is important. I think today is an unprecedented times. Um, so there'll be longer term that we need stuff that we need to focus on. For policy makers, we're looking at, uh, you know, how do we make the trade-offs between sustainability and energy security access or versus managing budgets, uh, quality healthcare versus uh, equitable access. You know, all this goes on. But for women, this is what we need to do. We think about women leadership, 
truth is, uh, when, when women is in charge, we take care of our families, communities, environment. We do not leave anybody behind. We do not start walls. <laughs> we understand trade-offs, okay? So my first response is this. How about removing and reducing the trade-offs that women face every single day? We face trade-offs like careers versus marriage, family versus ambition, immediate income versus putting money into education or building a career or building a business. Um, so what, it doesn't have to be a new law. It takes too long. How about providing government-funded services access to child, child care? Instead of waiting for private market to come in and provide those services, how about government becoming the lead investor? creating those blend of finance opportunities, providing tax breaks and incentives for companies to hire more women and to invest in women. So uh, safe environments for women to learn, I think that is important, but the coalitions and partnership platforms to increase new ways of developing income from working remotely at home or within the villages. So the first response is let's reduce trade-offs. Second response is that while the outline for the, uh, for the ASEAN and with your excellency on board is that I'm very grateful for the outline for the governments. But like any good investments or any good uh, agreements that we're going to plan to do, we need to ensure that it is what it says we will deliver. It comes down to execution. We have the will, we have the structure, we have the resources. Therefore, for more investors to be interested in investing in good businesses, not just women-led businesses, it cannot be a women's culture, social, community agenda. It's not a special project or initiative. What drives and what contributes to the GDP and well-being of a nation? It has to be an economic agenda. It has to be led by the trade industry, economic ministry. It has to be resourced primarily by public and philanthropic capital to de-risk for private capital to come in so as that they can address those trade-offs so that they can look for good returns and seed options. That will include developing a healthy secondaries market with a strong trusted stock exchanges for investors. So I ask your excellency and ASEAN finance ministers and leaders to make this beyond a women gender quality issue, let's make it an economic agenda. How about setting the goal for global half? Half of ASEAN's population is women, 49.64% to be exact. How about making a goal for half of our GDP to be women paid labor or the she female economy? Women as entrepreneurs, women as workers, women as traders, women as care supporters, and women as consumers. So uh, thank you for hearing. I'm just taking my opportunity to just share what is on top of my mind and to push this uh, economic agenda forward so that we can have a sustainable transformation. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. Um, Excellency Pavi and I are looking at you like a yes. <laughs> but um, may I, uh, uh, Dr. Pavi, is this okay if I ask you for any uh, response on um, the, what Juan was suggesting? And, and I also really agree with her point on, you know, bringing this up as a, a you know, so this is not the intention that the um, women-led enterprises should be prioritized. Rather, this is about uh, narrowing the gaps by lifting the uh, disadvantages that exist um but um and the, any disadvantages that are created uh should be lifted and these are approaches and uh bringing in also uh the ministry of finance in this whole discussion is a very important topic and i i feel that importance uh, after coming out from a, a gender chief to the country director who, who deals with the ministry of finance on a regular basis but I would like to, Excellency, if it, with your permission, uh, would you like to comment on the on the suggestion that Juan was making? Uh, thank you. It, it was interesting for me to listen to all the women leaders in the private sector, just to have um, uh, certain insight. As I said, uh, we need to listen to you in order for us I, I think that uh, Mrs. Wong, she said 
The government should be the lead investors. Yes, I agree with you. However, if you just say, okay, we, we will not take as a women agenda. We talk about the economic development for the recovery of the, the whole region of the worldwide. But if you just say that, even women is uh, represent 50%, almost 50% of uh, the, the region, they, they are not taking care of the gender responsive solution. Uh, sometimes we are completely neglected. So it's the reason why I agree with you, the Ministry of Finance should be in, the Ministry of Economy and Finance should be in. We always involve them, but we have to sit down close to them. And along with them, we need to, uh, to develop, uh, I mean, a gender responsive, sustainable solution. We have to say always gender responsive, sustainable solution. And I, I agree with you, we, we shouldn't highlight just women agenda, but unfortunately we have to be to be in. Otherwise, we are completely out of the, the framework. Um, uh, I think that uh, networking, yes, always networking, monitoring, coaching, yes, but also we need some successful model. More successful model are really uh, needed to um, uh, I mean, to show the way how we can uh, uh, have this transformational uh, approach. Thank you very much, Excellency. And then I also wanted to go back to the point that uh, we didn't touch upon much, which is about, uh, you know, um, support for, for care economy and then support for childcare. And, and it should not be any more of a choice, you know, between the work, the career versus business. and you know, in, in, in this uh, uh, generation still, we do have, it's much less now, but still uh, this has become quite um, evident during the, the COVID uh, time. And uh, investing in, in childcare is something that also all the government um, in ASEAN countries have been looking at. And uh, it has not been easy, but uh, this has been raised again and again in the platform. And uh, this is why we need more women leaders to be there as a decision maker to, to uh, as Vani also said earlier. Okay, um, I have a few questions uh, from uh, for some of the speakers uh, from the floor. So let me start with uh, a question that is right to uh, Danica. So Danica, you're in this um, business of uh, dyeing clothes and, and so on, and at the same time trying to find a sustainable solution. But the dying clothes also uh, uh, involves the pollution. And how are you managing that to, to make it more sustainable? I think this is the, the nature of the question. Danica? Yes, so as, as I mentioned, that is completely the truth. So textile dyeing is the second largest polluter of fresh water globally. So what we do is everything we make is dyed with plants. We grow each and every plant that we use to dye. We even grow our own cotton through regenerative farming. And this is the indigenous wisdom of planting things that actually heal the soil and so that it can absorb more carbon from the atmosphere. Thank you. Thank you very much. So yeah, I mean, indeed, that is actually the, the area your focus that the, you know you're making sure that that uh, you're um, aiming at the both sustainable and uh, at the same time involving the community. Okay, um, I have uh, another question that is. Uh, I think this is meant, uh, let me ask Vani this question. How can we help the different universities in Southeast Asia uh, as to gender inequality, as the sustainable solution, so as to recover in this pandemic? Uh, um, I think this question is a little bit, uh, so how would be the role of universities uh, in, in Southeast Asia and in ASEAN region in terms of supporting um, women and gender equality. And, and uh, as I said, I think the science and technology area is particularly important. Uh, Vani, do you have any suggestion on what, what the role of uh, universities that can support uh, 
uh, gender equality, and in particular, women in STEM areas? Yes, uh, thank you. So I think a university plays a, a very important role in uh, gender equality. So for example, uh, in ASEAN University networks, we have been, uh, there have been a lot of discussions on the uh, gender equality, including the, um, from, from as simple as the number of uh, graduate students, for example, in STEM, because uh, I know there are not really, um, a very big problem in Southeast Asia, but still there's like some uh, stereotype and some cultural uh, barriers, for example. So starting from that. And also I think in ASEAN, uh, we have agenda on mainstreaming a uh, woman's economic empowerment in ASEAN, which includes the education sector uh, and poverty and um, poverty eradication and uh, gender. Um, empowerment uh, and it will also include the mainstreaming of each uh, sectoral body uh, in in ASEAN starting from COSTI I believe from uh, our division and uh, the related uh, sectoral body so I think uh, ASEAN uh, uni a university in ASEAN will uh, play a lot of uh, important roles but I think one uh, also point that uh, I may suggest uh, to improve the uh, involvement of universities, also the individual roles, not only the role models of uh, women um, professorship, for example, but also um, uh, other uh, colleagues that are, um, paying a lot of attention to uh, gender equality. I hope it uh, <laughs> clarifies a little bit from my point of, uh, from my, my point of view, but there are some uh, actually some uh, work plans that already established uh, in ASEAN. Thank you. Yeah, uh, indeed, I need a number count, you know, so that uh, in professorship is important, but also those who are interested um, so in, one thing is the more women in the faculty, because I've been also hearing that it's in, it's very difficult to maintain the, the female faculty members. One the one one thing is that uh, more entry of uh, of women in STEM areas, but also to retain them. Uh, I mean, because of the the multiple reasons that we already talked about in terms of the difficulty in managing the work life balance. Um, not having the, the support, uh, not being understood in the areas that were male dominated, it's, uh, it hasn't been easy. So uh, again, um, having, finding the champions around is very important. So, and, and on this note, I, I have another question that came up, which is, uh, so this is from Lou, um, about what about uh, um, women, I mean, we have been talking about a women's networking, training and supporting each other, but the reality is that men, Still dominates in the economy and uh, in area in our area of work, and so what do we get? What can we? Uh, what do we do to get more men to support sustainable transformation uh, that is required for uh, COVID recovery? Um, does any of you want to take a crack at that? Well, the yeah. reason why I talk about making it as an economic agenda is to get our male allies and partners on board. If we continue to press hard on um, what I call sometimes alienating or, or, or this interesting uh, uh, topic, um, they stop listening. We must do our part using uh, on the ground NGOs and our governments to remove gender-based violence, discrimination, and all of that. Those frameworks and systems need to take in place. So I'm very grateful that your excellency is taking this leadership. But having said that, if we want to have promote partnership for the goals, we really need to get the other half of the population on board. And that is to pursue an economic agenda 
uh, making sure there's economic empowerment for all. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Bon. Anyone else who wants to? So yeah, Bon. Also, you said that the, the earlier about that you had the uh, mentor, both male and female, and 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 this is very important. Actually, you had the male uh, mentor, and the, the whole idea is to understand the business and not necessarily being a woman and being a man. Um, it's a very important point for, for us to pay, uh, pay attention to. Um, anyone else? Let me uh, ask Danica. Do you have any suggestion? Oh, sorry, I see Vani. Vani, you want to go first? Yeah, sure. I just want to add a little bit, uh, maybe adding my personal experience. I think I wouldn't be here without my partner in crime, my husband. <laughs> and so I think a partnership between women and men are very important. And during the decision making, it's not that uh, I feel sometimes that it's not that men do not understand, but we just need to discuss. And when they support, I think we will have one whole community to reduce the gender gap uh, as soon as possible and as fast as uh, we can. Thank you. Thank you. Danica? Yes, I mean, I agree with all the points, but I feel that these arguments are maybe more relevant towards women who are living in urban centers, because if we talk about the majority of women, they tend to live in rural areas. And as, again, as I mentioned, they have very different realities than what we're discussing here. So it wouldn't really necessarily touch them. What would help, however, is to recognize that for women in rural areas, there are very limited sectors in which they can work. The first being agriculture, of course. So Priyanka, definitely first on. The second being craft. And I think it relates to something that you kind of mentioned previously, Sonomi, that of course we're looking at the future now, but through our work, I'm actually humble learning from these women. And it's not to be forgotten that in ASEAN, we have a strength that perhaps is under-recognized, which is our own culture. I was trained as an economist, so for me it was all about like numbers, GDP, graphs, and whatever. But then learning from these women, I feel like I'm learning more about what a human-centric economy should look like. And then it has a lot to do with not forgetting our past and our cultures because there are so many indigenous wisdom that are so relevant right now when we're talking about the climate crisis. Not all the solution needs to come from technology, I believe because a lot of the way of living that was practiced by our ancestors hold a lot of wisdom that we can really, with the low hanging fruit, uh, implement in our today's economy to make it greener. So now yeah. may, may I respond to what Danica has just mentioned? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Danica, I love that uh, feedback. It's very important that when we say we don't want to leave anybody behind, the rural population and coastal communities needs to come in to the agenda. Um, I'd like to share 41% of China's GDP is powered and driven by women. And a lot of this is actually by the rural population. There is a very good project since 2010 by the Chinese government with Alibaba and some of the e-commerce platforms. What they do is that they use technologies to harness the supply, to remove the supply chain or the frontline commerce uh, uh, issues. And however, the products and services is empowered by the rural population. So the cottage industries and the cross industries can come in together. Now, the capital and resources is financed by both philanthropy private capital, as well as the Chinese government taking the lead in creating the energy. I may not have exact details, but when I know about how that GDP is formed and how it is empowered by most of the rural population, I'm very excited about the possibilities in ASEAN. Thank you. Yeah, very good point, very good point. Um, and really, it's all about system development, you know, and then, of course, that it depends on the individuals, but the the system really uh, matters. And then lifting the barriers in this process is, is very important. I, it's very intrigued by the 41% uh, 
um, yeah, um, this is a very interesting point that you're making. Uh, Mc Mc McKinsey and IMF, IMF state that, so you can check the facts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I was going to ask for the sources. Great. That sounds uh, very good. And, you know, that kind of gives us a hope for the future. Um, I didn't ask Priyanka uh, the, the final remarks. So uh, Priyanka, if you have anything on, on the a similar question uh, or uh, last remark. Yeah, I think I work with the rural uh, uh, farmers over here, with the producer, with the suppliers. And what I can understand with my experience is that when we talk about AI, when we talk about things like that, for them, it is like they still need a support how to label their products, how they can sell their products on the market, whereas they are also doing their bit towards contributing towards the economy. I think having innovation centers where the government or the public sector can help them to uh, bridge the skill gap. When we sitting here are speaking about so many bigger things, but they over there who are doing the work, they don't know what is going on. That means that's a huge skill gap. If we can focus on how we can bridge the skill gap, I think that will be much more helpful. And how to do that is that having some innovation centers in the rural places where they can come and know how to, how what is going on in the market, what is going on in the world, just to educate them a bit more. I think that is going to be a, a life changer for uh, the women who are working in the rural sector. Thank you for, for that suggestion. In fact, that uh, Excellency and I have been working <laughs> for long years on that. And, and certainly, I think we need to also make a progress in that. Um, on this note, I have to say that the time is coming up to the, uh, the very close to the end of this program. But uh, before thanking all the speakers, I'm going to ask uh, Julia. So Julia, is uh, is our partner um, organizer for, for this event and uh, julia is going to be uh, julia from erii is going to be um closing this session and and, and julia marston she's a director of a strategy and partnership of the eria and she works in close connection with the asean policy make makers and the regional global organizations to support the ASEAN process and social economic integration. So Julia, over to you. Thank you very much, Tonami, and thank you very much to ADB Seeds for this excellent collaboration. We are very glad to be part of ADB Seeds Symposium this year. I really enjoyed and learned from the conversation today. Uh, I'm going to be very brief because I know we are, we are running out of time, but let me just maybe highlight two points two key points that were made during the conversation, which, which I think are really worth uh, picking up uh, a little bit again. The first one is something that we discussed at the beginning, that is uh, innovation uh, uh, during the pandemic. So the pandemic actually forced us to be more innovative and to develop uh, new approaches and new mindsets. And this is something that I think uh, we should retain uh, when uh, working towards the sustainable transformation in Southeast Asia. Um, so again, some of the speakers highlighted this as a silver lining of the pandemic. Definitely it's something that we learned and we should continue to learn. The other one is about collaboration and the need to bring in to the discussion, the discussion we had today, multiple ministries. We heard it very clearly as these are issues that uh, require a horizontal and cross-cutting collaborations, but also perspective from different places, both urban and rural areas, uh, and from uh, different type of stakeholders. Reminding us that uh, this conversation is concerning 100% of the population, not only 50%, and therefore men need to be very much engaged in this kind of discussions. It was really great to hear from uh, uh, multiple stakeholders. Uh, the multi-stakeholder approach is absolutely crucial. And this is why it was so interesting to hear from policymaker, Her Excellency Dr. Pavi, but also Vanya at the Assistant Secretariat, entrepreneurs like Danica and Priyanka, but also investors like, like Vaughn or even scientists, Vanya again. They all bring their own perspective. Uh, which is very important because, again, we talked also about uh, the decision-making room. We know very well that diversity is crucial to take better decisions, 
diversity in terms of gender, but also diversity in terms of uh, different backgrounds around the table, because by bringing in different perspectives, this is how we can see problems in different ways and find solutions more easily. So I'm really, really happy that we managed to uh, bring in different points of view uh, at this table. And actually, uh, just before giving the floor back uh, to Sonomi, um, we want to continue this conversation uh, even at AREA. And this is why we're actually launching this day a new platform that is called ESI Knowledge Lab to precisely continue to connect with innovators, startuppers, entrepreneurs, organizations like ADB, and I hope as many as the participants we are having today uh, to continue to discuss how innovation and startup ecosystems across the region can really contribute to a post-pandemic sustainable development. Thank you very much and back to Sonomi. Thank you, Julia, and thank you once again also for co-organizing this seminar. And I need to touch upon and thank also uh, Veronica, who has been from ADB side to, to get working together with Julia to put the, to make this uh, panel possible. I'd like to thank all the participants, uh, Excellency Pavi, Ramesh, uh, Bon, Priyanka, uh, Danica, and Vani. Thank you all of you, and thank you all the participants for for engaging and joining us for today. Uh, the the the. Uh, Seats will still continue on until tomorrow, and then please uh, um, stay stay on. Thank you very much. Thank you, all the participants. Bye for now. <laughs>